Hi and welcome to Themeco. In this lesson, we will talk about the classification of a mechanism according to the number of resultant degrees of freedom. We will see what the characteristics of each of these cases are and what are their physical implications. By the end of the video, it is expected that you understand completely this classification and confidently know how to identify them. To recap, in the previous lesson, we said that a mechanism can be called a dynamically driven mechanism if the number of resultant degrees of freedom are positive and larger than zero. We also said that if the number of degrees of freedom is negative, we are in the presence of an overconstrained system. Finally, we said that if the resultant number of degrees of freedom was zero, then we can call that system a kinematically driven system. Now let me stop right there and expand this thought a little. You see, Kinematically means that something is related to movement. However, we have systems with zero degrees of freedom. These systems are static structures, a truss for example, and we definitely don't want anything kinematical in a truss. The reason I bring up this point is because in this course we are not dealing with static structures. But if you are curious to learn more about static structures, check out our Mechanics 1 course which specifically focuses on different statics-related topics. Our aim here, now, is to study the motion of moving mechanisms. If we limit the course scope to moving mechanisms, then we need to agree that we are safely referring to kinematically driven mechanisms when the system has zero degrees of freedom. Now that we took that out of the way, let us come back to our main topic. Let's bring in these three mechanisms. We have the same crankshaft mechanism but with different constraint conditions. The system A is a crankshaft mechanism with three revolute joints and one planar joint. If we remember correctly, the number of degrees of freedom of this system is 1. This system fits into the category of a dynamically driven system. This means to move the system, we will need to provide a torque around point O. In system B, we have the same number of geometrical constraints, as in the case of system A. But additionally, we have a motion input imposed as a constraint on the crank. This additional motion constraint makes our system a kinematically driven system. In this case, we need to employ a kinematic analysis to solve the system's positions, velocities and accelerations. Okay, but what is the difference between these two previous systems? Imagine if we have a stopped crankshaft mechanism at time equal to zero. And if we apply the torque to make it move, the system will first respond slowly while the torque overcomes the inertia of a stopped system. Then the applied torque will gradually increase the system's rotational velocity until a dynamic equilibrium where the rotational velocity has its maximum value is reached. How the system goes from zero to its stable regime depends on the system's inertia and external loads applied to it. In contrast to the velocity response of system A, the velocity response of system B will go from zero velocity to its prescribed velocity almost instantaneously. This is due to the imposed kinematic constraint on the system's crank. If we were to plot the value of this rotational velocity against time, the graph would resemble a step function. The case to consider here is that, regardless of the inertia or external loads applied to the system, the crank will rotate at this speed no matter what. Physically, systems A and B might be similar, but conceptually, they behave totally differently. And this is where the solution or simulation approach differs. The last system, system C, has four revolute joints and one planar joint resulting in a system with minus one degrees of freedom. This is the example of an overconstrained system. Notice that an overconstrained system does not mean that it won't necessarily move. Think of a normal door. We have one body and up to three revolute joints on it, and it still moves. So it will be also important to know the type and location of the different constraints to understand how the body moves. I hope you enjoyed the video and you got a firm grasp of how to classify different systems according to what we have seen here. Thanks for watching and see you soon.